doctor can get this far without even meeting his subjects, think how well someone sensitive to human nuances and not overly scrupulous might do. Why are we so easily taken in by fortune tellers, psychic seers, palmists, tea leaf, tarot and yarrow readers and their ilk? Of course, they note our posture, facial expressions, clothing and answers to seemingly innocuous questions. Some of them are brilliant at it, and these are areas about which many scientists seem almost unconscious. There is also a computer network to which professional psychics subscribe, the details of their customers' lives available to their colleagues in an instant. A key tool is the so-called cold read, a statement of opposing predispositions so tenuously balanced that anyone will recognize a grain of truth. Here's an example. At times you are extroverted, affable, sociable, while at other times you are introverted, wary and reserved. You have found it unwise to be too frank in revealing yourself to others. You prefer a certain amount of change and variety and become dissatisfied when hemmed in by restrictions and limitations. Disciplined and controlled on the outside, you tend to be worrisome and insecure on the inside. While you have some personality weaknesses, you are generally able to compensate for them. You have a great deal of unused capacity, which you have not turned to your advantage. You have a tendency to be critical of yourself. You have a strong need for other people to like you and for them to admire you. Almost everyone finds this characterization recognizable, and many feel that it describes them perfectly. Small wonder, we are all human. The list of evidence that some therapists think demonstrates repressed childhood sexual abuse, for example in The Courage to Heal by Ellen Bass and Laura Davis, is very long and prosaic. It includes sleep disorders, overeating, anorexia and bulimia, sexual dysfunction, vague anxieties, and even an inability to remember childhood sexual abuse. Another book by the social worker E. Sue Bloom lists, among other telltale signs of forgotten incest, headaches, suspicion or its absence, excessive sexual passion or its absence, and adoring one's parents. Among diagnostic items for detecting dysfunctional families listed by Charles Whitfield, MD, are aches and pains, feeling more alive in a crisis, being anxious about authority figures, and having tried counseling or psychotherapy, yet feeling that something is wrong or missing. Like the cold read, if the list is long and broad enough, everyone will have symptoms. Skeptical scrutiny is not only the toolkit for rooting out bunkum and cruelty that prey on those least able to protect themselves and most in need of our compassion. People offered little other hope. It is also a timely reminder that mass rallies, radio and television, the print media, electronic marketing and mail order technology permit other kinds of lies to be injected into the body politic, to take advantage of the frustrated, the unwary and the defenseless in a society riddled with political ills that are being treated ineffectively, if at all. Baloney, bamboozles, careless thinking, flim-flam, and wishes disguised as facts are not restricted to parlour magic and ambiguous advice on matters of the heart. Unfortunately, they ripple through mainstream political, social, religious, and economic issues in every nation. The myths and folklore of many pre-modern cultures have explanatory, or at least mnemonic, value. In stories that everyone can appreciate and even witness, they encode the environment, which constellations are rising or the orientation of the Milky Way on a given day of the year can be remembered by a story about lovers reunited or a canoe negotiating the sacred river. Since recognizing the sky is essential for planting and reaping and following the game, such stories have important practical value. They can also be helpful as psychological projective tests or as reassurances of humanity's place in the universe. But that doesn't mean that the Milky Way really is a river or that a canoe really is traversing it before our eyes. Quinine comes from an infusion of the bark of a particular tree from the Amazon rainforest. How did pre-modern people ever discover that a tea made from this tree, of all the plants in the forest, would relieve the symptoms of malaria? They must have tried every tree and every plant, roots, stems, bark, leaves, tried chewing on them, mashing them up, making an infusion. This constitutes a massive set of scientific experiments continuing over generations, Experiments that, moreover, could not be duplicated today for reasons of medical ethics. Think of how many bark infusions from other trees must have been useless, or made the patient wretch, or even die. In such a case, the healer chalks these potential medicines off the list and moves on to the next. The data of ethnopharmacology may not be systematically or even consciously acquired. By trial and error, though, and carefully remembering what worked, eventually they get there.
using the rich molecular riches in the plant kingdom to accumulate a pharmacopoeia that works. Absolutely essential, life-saving information can be acquired from folk medicine and in no other way. We should be doing much more than we are to mine the treasures in such folk knowledge worldwide. Certain kinds of folk knowledge are valid and priceless. Others are at best metaphors and codifiers. Ethnomedicine, yes. Astrophysics, no. It is certainly true that all beliefs and all myths are worthy of a respectful hearing. It is not true that all folk beliefs are equally valid, if we're talking not about an internal mindset, but about understanding the external reality. A complaint is that science is too simple-minded, too reductionist. It naively imagines that in the final accounting there will be only a few laws of nature, perhaps even rather simple ones, that explain everything, that the exquisite subtlety of the world, all the snow crystals, spider web latticework, spiral galaxies, and flashes of human insight can ultimately be reduced to such laws. Reductionism seems to pay insufficient respect to the complexity of the universe. It appears to some as a curious hybrid of arrogance and intellectual laziness. To Isaac Newton, it looked like a clockwork universe. The astonishing fact is that similar mathematics applies so well to planets and to clocks. It needn't have been this way. We didn't impose it on the universe. That's the way the universe is. If this is reductionism, so be it. Until the middle 20th century, there had been a strong belief among theologians, philosophers, and many biologists, that life was not reducible to the laws of physics and chemistry, that there was a vital force, an entelechy, a Tao, a mana, that made living things go. It animated life. It was impossible to see how mere atoms and molecules could account for the intricacy and elegance, the fitting of form to function, of a living thing. The world's religions were invoked. God or the gods breathed life, soul stuff, into inanimate matter. The 18th century chemist Joseph Priestley tried to find the vital force. He weighed a mouse just before and just after it died. It weighed the same. All such attempts have failed. If there is soul stuff, evidently it weighs nothing. That is, it is not made of matter. Nevertheless, even biological materialists entertained reservations. Perhaps, if not plant, animal, fungal, and microbial souls, some still undiscovered principle of science was needed to understand life. I remember very well when the molecular structure of DNA and the nature of the genetic code were first elucidated in the 1950s and 1960s, how biologists who studied whole organisms accused the new proponents of molecular biology of reductionism. They'll never understand even a worm with their DNA. Of course, reducing everything to a vital force is no less reductionism. But it is now clear that all life on Earth, every single living thing, has its genetic information encoded in its nucleic acids and employs fundamentally the same codebook to implement the hereditary instructions. We have learned how to read the code. The same few dozen organic molecules are used over and over again in biology for the widest variety of functions. Genes bearing significant responsibility for cystic fibrosis and breast cancer have been identified. The 1.8 million rungs of the DNA ladder of the bacterium Haemophilus influenzae, comprising its 1,743 genes, have been sequenced. The specific function of most of these genes is beautifully detailed, from the manufacture and folding of hundreds of complex molecules, to protection against heat and antibiotics, to increasing the mutation rate, to making identical copies of the bacterium. Much of the genomes of many other organisms, including the roundworm, Senohabditis elegans, have now been mapped. Molecular biologists are busily recording the sequence of the three billion nucleotides that specify how to make a human being. In another decade or two, they'll be done. Whether the benefits will ultimately exceed the risks seems by no means certain. The continuity between atomic physics, molecular chemistry, and that holy of holies, the nature of reproduction and heredity, has now been established. No new principle of science needed to be invoked. It looks as if there are a small number of simple facts that can be used to understand the enormous intricacy and variety of living things. Molecular genetics also teaches that each organism has its own particularity. Reductionism is even better established in physics and chemistry. We hear, for example, from the theologian Langdon Gilkey in his Nature, Reality and the Sacred, that the notion of the laws of nature being everywhere the same is simply a preconception imposed on the universe by fallible scientists and their social milieu. He longs for other kinds of knowledge, as valid in their contexts as science is in its. But the order of the universe is not an assumption, it's an observed fact. 
We detect the light from distant quasars 